Talk Radio Europe. Friday Sports Bar with Dom Aldworth. Good evening and welcome back to the show, the Friday Night Sports Bar with me, Dom Aldworth. My next guest needs very little introduction. Millions of motorsport fans around the world fell in love with Formula One just because of his voice. Before we bring him in, have a listen to this. Anything can happen in Formula One, and it usually does. One light, two lights, three lights, four lights, five lights, and it's go, 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 go. Murray Walker, OBE, thank you very much for coming on the Friday Night Sports Bar this evening. My pleasure, Dom. Great to be with you. Uh, Murray, before we talk about Formula One, and in particular this season, uh, there's a couple of questions I want to talk about really your marvellous career. It all began in 1948. That was your first broadcast. If I'm correct in saying it was the Shelsley Welsh Hill Climb. I mean, your clear passion for broadcasting of motorsport. I mean, how did this come about? Where did it come from, Murray? Well, I guess, Dom, really, it came from my father because my father was a professional racing motorcyclist. He won the TT, which is the jewel in the crown of motorcycle sport. And uh, he won virtually all the Continental Grand Prix. And I grew up in a motorsport atmosphere and uh, loved it. And then I was in the Army during the war. When I came out, I started racing bikes. But I wasn't good enough to satisfy myself. And you know what they say, those that can do and those that can't talk about it. So I started talking about it. And Murray, you're big, throughout the 70s you were sort of doing part-time bits and pieces on Formula One. I think, if I'm correct in saying, your big break came in 1976 when it became a permanent fixture for you. I mean, how did this opportunity come about? And just to test you slightly, who won the World Championship in that year? In 1970, James Hunt. And, okay, I thought I'd try and test you there, but how did the opportunity come about then? Uh, well, uh, I had been doing commentary, Dom, on motorcycle racing and Formula 3 car racing, the British Touring Car Championship, virtually everything except Formula 1 since 1949. And then in 1978, actually, um, the BBC started after James Hunt had retired. They, d they decided they were going to do all the, all the Formula 1 Grand Prix on television. And that's when they asked me to do it. I, I took uh, quite a big step from having done all the other things with engines up into Formula One. And then I did it from 1979 until 2001. I'm still doing the odd thing. I've just come back from Australia where I was doing some stuff on the fantastic V8 supercar series they have there. Murray, in reference to Formula One and your commentary career, which has sort of spanned almost three decades, approximately 18 world champions, the likes of Sir Jackie Stewart, Nicky Lauda, Keki Rosberg, Nelson Piquet, Ayrton Senna, Michael Schumacher, some great names in there. And of course, a, a very close friend of yours, uh, the late James Hunt, again a world champion. Out of your commentary career and what you've seen in F1, who's the greatest champion of the lot that you've seen? It's, it's a question, Don, that that's impossible to answer, really, because you can't really compare drivers from one generation with another because they were driving different cars on different circuits to different regulations in different circumstances. I mean, was, was, was Fangio greater than Jackie Stewart? Was Senna greater than Jim Clark? It, it's a, you can make a subjective judgment, uh, in my opinion. The, the greatest of them all ever was Tarsio Nuvolari, who raced before the war, and in Formula One, Fangio. But, and, and, and people don't give Sterling Moss all the credit that he should deserve. But you can argue until you're, you're blue in the face, but uh, in Formula One terms, I would say Fangio. One of the last names in the question I, I, I previously asked you was uh, a gentleman by the name of James, James Hunt, who won the World Championship in 1976. You had a very special relationship with him, Murray. Uh, it didn't all begin very well, uh, but you worked... No, I... I um James was a very different sort of person to all the rest of us, uh, Dom. He had a nightclub out in Marbella, as you probably know, called Oscars, named after his dog. Uh, and, and James was very different to all the rest of us. He uh, um, smoked like a chimney and drank like a fish, and uh, there were a lot of things about him I didn't admire. And when he was paired with me in 1980, to be honest, I thought they were putting him in and going to ease me out, which was actually never the intention. So there was a bit of friction between us for quite a long time because we were so different temperamentally. 
but it seemed to work very well in terms of chemistry in the commentary box, and the viewers liked it. And uh, after a while, we knocked all the rough edges off each other and accepted each other's imperfections, and we both got them. And uh, it was a real tragedy when he died in, uh, at, at the very early age of 45. And it was certainly a great double act for, for any Formula fan that was tuned in listening to both of you commentate on the races. You always had us captivated. Uh, talking about coverage, obviously the BBC coverage today, um, I personally think is superb with Jake Humphreys, Eddie Jordan, Martin Brundle and David Coulthard in the mix there. Of course they've got all this technology nowadays, which you didn't have in your day. How was it for you from race to race? I mean, did you have monitors up that you could actually see what's going on all around the track? How was it for you in, in those days? Um, well, it, it, it changed over the the years because when I started doing Formula One in 1978 there were hardly any facilities at all. I used to sit out in the open air on a park, park chair basically with a monitor stuck in front of me. I did my own timing with a clockwork watch. I, we didn't, I had a, a lap scorer who literally wrote the numbers down on a piece of paper as the cars went past and then things slowly got more sophisticated and we got Proper, proper, we got colour television when I started off, it was black and white. Um, we, we got a lot more sophisticated facilities, and of course now, as you've rightly said, they are absolutely superb. When, when the BBC was doing it, uh, I didn't think they did it as well as they should have done, and that's why they lost the contract to ITV, the commercial channel, who lost it in turn to BBC a couple of years ago. Uh, and the BBC are now doing the finest job, I think, in the world. They're absolutely brilliant. And if you're lucky enough to live in England, you get an hour before the race with all the preamble. And then you get about an hour or an hour and a half even after the race. So you get about four and a half hours of coverage and a detailed examination of everything that moved. It's absolutely superb. And I wish it had been like that in my day. Yeah, sure. We, we, we get it out here in Spain. We get that sort of 45 minutes to an hour beforehand. And it is absolutely All right, I didn't know that. Um, Murray, let's fast forward. Formula One uh, this season, in particular this season. Um, plenty of changes and innovations. Pirelli ties back in, I believe, after a 13-year absence. The, the DR rest system, which is the retractable rear wing. Of course, all the cars now carry curves. It was Nico Rosberg only a couple of days ago said he felt that the DRS system was one of the greatest innovations in Formula One. In your, in your experience, all these new innovations, do you think it's good for the sport? Well, there's a lot of controversy about it, Dom. A lot of people are saying it's, it's very artificial and uh, the, 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 the drivers should just get in the cars and drive them to the end of the race. But it's been artificial ever since it began because there's always been some sort of, some sort of restriction. I mean, uh, it's perfectly possible for tyre manufacturers to last tyres which would, to, to make tyres which would last a whole season, never mind part of a race. And of course the constructors could put fuel tanks in the car which are big enough to take them to the end of the race. But until recently we had refueling. Uh, I think this year is turning out to be absolutely terrific. Everybody's been screaming out and saying they want more passing. Well, now they've got it, and we've got all the, all the different strategies which are being worked out during the race, and you don't really know what's going to happen until about the last five laps of the race, and there's an enormous amount of change during it. Uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, well, the, well, the Chinese uh, Grand Prix was certainly all about that. And, uh, you know, literally it was the last 10 laps, five laps, as you said, before we knew it was going to come out there. And, I mean, yes. the, the, the DRS system, this uh, retractable rear wing, I mean, there's something that was raised during the week that I read. I mean, of course, you can use that during in a, in a specifically allocated straight uh, within a race. You can use it at any time during free practice, as far as I'm aware. Um, but you can only activate the rear wing within a second of the person that you're looking to overtake. Why? Why do you think the FIA or Formula One didn't allow the person that's to defend his lead by using his wing as well? I, th I think they were worried, Dom, that if they allowed, um, if they allowed unrestricted use of the wing, um, that uh, there, would, there would be almost too much passing, and it really would become artificial. Uh, I think it's turned out very well indeed as an innovation, and actually I would like to see the drivers allowed to use it whenever they want to, because the best driver will always get the best out of the car. 
And talking about the Chinese UBS Chinese Grand Prix, I mean, that for me was one of the most exciting races. And, and of course, Red Bull managed to secure themselves a, a second in Sebastian Vettel and a third in that particular race as well, Murray. And I want to talk a little bit about Red Bull. Um, of course, they've delivered the constructors last year, world champion in Sebastian Vettel. Christian Horner and his team have done a superb job. But how much of their, how much of their success is, is down to the genius of, of their designer, Adrian Newey? Well, um, an enormous amount of it. I won't say most of it, because, first of all, their success is down to the fact that Dieter Mateschitz, who is the man who is the part owner of Red Bull, he and a, and a Thai chap share it between them, uh, has shown how enthusiastic he is by being prepared to spend unlimited amounts of money to get the right people and the right facilities and a enable them to build up a team. And the same thing applies to Christian Tor Horner, who is the team principal. He's done an absolutely fabulous job. Uh, all the people that they have recruited have done extremely well because there's been plenty of money and they can get the best people by paying them the high salaries. Uh, but having said that, it's undoubtedly the genius of Adrian Newey, who has produced world win championship winning cars for Williams and McLaren before Red Bull, that's enabled Red Bull to get the job done. But uh, without all those other people and Mateschitz's money, Adrian Newey couldn't have done his job. And equally, without Adrian Newey, all the other people couldn't have done theirs. It really has been a team effort. Lots of debate still raging on, Murray, about Michael Schumacher coming back into Formula One. Of course, it was the dream ticket for him, bearing in mind Ross Braun, his team principal at Ferrari, was at Mercedes GP. It was a great opportunity for him to come back personally. How do you view his decision to come out of retirement and, and back into Formula One? Do you think it's been good for the sport? Well, first of all, I admire him enormously for coming back. And he came back because... Uh, he was really eased out of Ferrari to make room for Kimi Raikkonen before Schumacher wanted to stop, before Schumacher was really ready to stop. Uh, and that's demonstrated by the fact that he took up motorcycle racing, and you need a lot of guts to do that, because to go from four wheels to two is in infinitely harder than going from two wheels to four. So I admire him for that, and I admire him for coming back. He said he wanted to come back to have fun. He's having fun. Uh, I still think, Dom, and uh, I'm a bit of a voice in the wilderness with this, that Michael Schumacher can get the job done by winning races if he's got a car that's worthy of his talent. And so far, neither that last year nor this year has he had that. Uh, people will say, well, he's been beaten by Nico Rosberg, and he has been. But you have to take into account the fact that he was out of it for three years. Uh, you inevitably get rusty. Formula One moves on. It's an enormously sophisticated sport. There are a lot of changes in three years, and you have to master them. I think he's done that now, and if he gets a car that can win... He will do, I think, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more with regards to the, the, the Mercedes GP car, but we did see some uh, much improved performances by the car um, at the Chinese Grand Prix, and hopefully with a three-week break they can go take all that data together and, and produce a much better car for the, uh, the race in, in Turkey. Yes. And, and Murray, uh, out of all the drivers on the grid, if you gave them a level playing field, who for you is the best driver out there at the moment? Well, uh... I, it, 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 three stand out for me, Dom. There's um, Vettel, of course, and Lewis Hamilton, uh, and Jensen Button. Uh, you've got three world champions there. They're all very worthy world champions. I suppose if I, if you stood me against the wall and said you've got to give me one name, it would be Lewis Hamilton. Right, OK, interesting one, very much so. And, of course, young Paul DeResta as well coming through, having a, a very good debut season thus far, only three races in, but he looks like a great talent for the future. And alongside uh, Sergio Perez as well from Mexico. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, Perez was very good in the Australian Grand Prix. <clears throat> he finished seventh in his first race, only to be disqualified through no fault of his own. Uh, he's obviously a real talent. Uh, I think the rest are even more of a talent because to get points in your first two races and very nearly in your first three races 
in something as competitive as Formula One with as little experience as he has got in Formula One is a, a very notable achievement and I think he's going a long way and I'm, I, I don't think I know that the top teams are looking at him and I wouldn't be at all surprised if he ends up in Mercedes-Benz next year. That's right. We were just talking about that before the show actually and uh, one of the gentlemen sitting in, uh, in the studio said exactly the same thing. Uh, Murray, before we go, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, how's the voice these days anyway? Anyway. Well, yeah, you'll have to judge yourself. You've been listening to it for the last few minutes. Uh, it's fine as far as I know. Dom, uh, uh, I'm in good shape. I'm very much enjoying life and I'm still doing some commentary on odd events. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to, I would love to do Formula One, but I haven't got the stamina to do the traveling now. Well, have you got the stamina to give our listeners out there a little send off, perhaps of the start of a, a Formula One race for us before we let you go? Yes, I have. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is Murray Walker. So watch the lights, five lights, four lights, three lights, two lights, one, and it's go, go, go. Murray Walker, you're an absolute legend and your voice will be remembered forever. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the Friday Night Sports Bar this evening. It's been a pleasure to have you on. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Cheers, Cheerio. Man.